Donald Danforth Plant Science Center, HEC-TV, and St. Louis Public Radio present Conversations. From the Clean Water Act to Everglades Restoration, 40 Years of Conservation. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening. I'm Molly Klein, and I'm chair of the Friends Committee, and we're going to be talking about from the Clean Water Act to Everglades Restoration, 40 Years of Conservation. As a plant scientist, uh, by my academic training, uh, it's very um, heartening and compelling to reflect on the mission of the Danforth Plant Science Center. And that is to improve the human condition through plant science, feed the hungry, and improve human health, preserve and renew our environment, and enhance the St. Louis region as a world center for plant science. And that is happening. So we are very blessed to have this world-class institution in our backyard. I'd also like to thank, <laughs> this evening's sponsors, St. Louis Public Radio and HEC Higher Education TV. Uh, this evening's session will be recorded and the premiere uh, will start of the recording uh, to be aired May 3rd, and it will continue to air on Sundays at 5 p.m. and Tuesdays at 8 a.m. in the month of May. Now, how many in this room do Twitter? Hmm, a few, okay, well. This is the second time for conversations that we've done this, but we will have a live Twitter wall. So if you Twitter, and this will allow other people who aren't here tonight to follow uh, some of the line of the discussion. But please tweet if you have any questions at the Danforth Center. And the hashtag for the event is hashtag Convo, capital STL. Our distinguished panel this evening is going to be kicked off uh, by Dan Burkhart. And for those of you who know Dan, um, he and his wife Connie are very dedicated to conservation. And in 2010, they co-founded the Katy Trail Land Trust to help uh, protect our rural and scenic environment along um, the river. And I'm sure many of us in this room have already benefited from that work. And thank you. In addition, uh, Dan has lent his time and talent to many boards. Uh, and in our area alone, just to name a few, the Missouri Botanical Garden, the Mercantile Library, the Nine Network of Public Media, and since 2006, the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center a real friend. So Dan, the, the stage is yours. Well, it's a real honor to be here tonight, uh, to be involved in a little way with a couple organizations that do so much to help the world. The Donald Danforth Plant Science Center and the Everglades Foundation. It's a, it's a great uh, duo. Uh, Connie and I first saw the Everglades and the Florida Keys about 20 years ago. And when we saw it, we recognized two things right away. We'd never seen water more beautiful than that that surrounded the Florida Keys and Florida Bay. And we also realized we never wanted to be anywhere else in January and February. <laughs> um, so not long after we came to that uh, revelation, we discovered the Everglades Foundation. We loved a lot about Florida Bay. We loved things like this, roseate spoonbills. That's a photo that's in our book, Florida Bay Forever. And we wanted to find out who was doing work to protect the habitat for beautiful creatures like this. 
and who was preserving the water quality. We found out the Everglades Foundation was doing that. We met Nathaniel Reed and others who guided the work of the foundation. And as a small way to show our appreciation for everything they did, we put together the book that Molly mentioned earlier. We wanted to connect the beauty of Florida Bay to the value of the Everglades as a source of water for all of South Florida. So to set the stage for tonight's discussion, I'm just going to show a couple of photos from our book. The cover, the most notable thing about the cover is Jimmy Buffett's name is on it, so that's <laughs> very, very valuable. Uh, and he's, uh, he's very active and uh, supports the Everglades Foundation in many ways. But uh, for more than a century, people have been fooling with the Everglades trying to improve it. You can see this photo right here. This is a naturally flowing Everglades River, but somebody had the idea they could do better. And they could make a canal there that would drain the swamp and let the Everglades be used for a lot of things that it never should have been. Things like subdivisions, things like farmland where it shouldn't have been. This has been going on since the 1800s. A fellow Missourian was in the Everglades in 1947 to dedicate Everglades National Park. And when that swamp was made a national park, it laid the foundation for all kinds of great conservation efforts in the future. If that park wasn't there today, it's hard to think of what would have become of the Everglades. And so we jump ahead to another president. And this was President Clinton signing the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan in 2000. And there's a couple people I want to point out. There's one right there that's Jeb Bush when he was the governor of Florida. And there's somebody else there that's with us tonight. I know you all know Jeb Bush, but you probably don't know Mary Barley, who's right there, right at the right hand of the president. Mary is co-founder of the Everglades Foundation, former chairman, uh, and recipient of all kinds of awards. She's known nationwide as one of the most vocal defenders of the Everglades. And since she surprised me by coming up here tonight, I wanted to surprise her and have Mary stand up and let everybody see who you are. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Uh, but women have played a role in saving the Everglades for a long time. In 1947, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas wrote a book called The River of Grass. And we all think of the River of Grass and we get an image that looks something like that. That's the pinnacle of the way the Everglades can look. Unfortunately, this has happened to a lot of the Everglades. This is the Tamiami Trail that I'm sure many of you have been on in South Florida goes from Naples to Miami. And ever since it was built in 1924, it's disrupted the flow of water south. It acts like a dam. And the Everglades Foundation has put in much time and effort to try to resolve that problem. It's not the only problem the Everglades has by any means, but it's a visual image of what man has done to wreak havoc with that ecosystem. This is where the Everglades end up, in the most beautiful estuary in the world, Florida Bay, and the most, one of the most threatened. Uh, it takes that river of grass and that water seeping through the swamp to provide the fresh water that's needed to nourish that estuary. And that is one of the things that the Everglades Foundation works to do. That's one of the most valuable creatures in the Everglades. <laughs> that is our guest speaker tonight, Nathaniel Reed, captured in his element in the swamp. Nathaniel has worked for decades. He was good enough to write the afterword in our book, Florida Bay Forever, and this photo is from that chapter. But he has dedicated his life He's written hundreds of articles and thousands of letters in defense of the Everglades. And uh, to get him here in his natural habitat, and he 
doesn't usually look like this in a coat and tie, so I wanted you to see him uh, the way he really looks. I can best introduce him by telling a story that sums up his resume. In the history of the National Geographic Society, there have only been two members of its board who haven't had to be voted on by the entire board of the National Geographic Society. The first one was Nathaniel Reed when Lady Bird Johnson asked that he take her seat on the board in the 1970s. And then Nathaniel, showing his usual excellent judgment, said that he wanted to select to succeed him, Peter Raven. So Peter Raven remains on the board of the National Geographic Society. He heads its exploration uh, committee. And Nathaniel, we in this room think you made a good choice. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so with that, I'd like to also introduce Eric Eichenberg, CEO of the Everglades Foundation, who is an old hand in Florida and national politics. And he knows well the airline schedule and the route from Miami to Tallahassee and to Washington, D.C. And that's how he spends his life fighting for the Everglades. So it was terrific that he took some time off in a very busy time for the Everglades Foundation to come up here and be with us. And with that, I'd introduce Eric and Nathaniel. Come on, just sit. Right in the middle. Right in the middle. Thank you, Dan. Thank, Thank you, Dan. Uh, absolutely superb. <laughs> Don't you think he did a beautiful job? <laughs> Well, well, thank you, Dan, for that um, generous introduction. We're delighted to be here in St. Louis. Uh, before we start, I do want to uh, thank Dr. Danforth uh, and Jim Carrington for having us here this evening, and for all of you for coming out uh, for this discussion. Uh, conservation, we're all brought together uh, this evening in support of conservation, um, and the topic you'll hear tonight, I think you'll find even more uh, unifying uh, than you may think. Uh, I do want to also acknowledge the great science team here at the Danforth Plant Science yeah. Center, the work that they're doing, the research on a daily basis, uh, tremendously important as we move forward into uh, this engaging global mm -hmm. community. Um, I'm also delighted to have this opportunity to interview you. I'm mm -hmm. delighted to be uh, interviewed by you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a true statesman uh, in Florida, um, a gentleman who has served distinguishedly both at the state and federal level. Um, I want to I want to begin Nathaniel with um, take you back to 1960, if I may. You had just uh, come out of your distinguished service to this nation uh, in the military. You had returned home, and that began a opportunity to decide what was next for your life. Um, I'm curious, and I'm sure many here in the room are curious. Why conservation? Well, I grew up in the woods. I grew up in the Indian River, literally. My mother said I came out of the womb casting a fly rod. <laughs> uh, all of my life I was privileged to live in near wilderness and wilderness. My mother and father encouraged me to everything from mounting of butterflies where I went to a wonderful school of lepidoptery, a botany, uh, learned every bird by name in, in the Northeast by the time I was 12. I don't know, it just it runs in my veins. Um, uh, what was interesting was that neither my mother fished or shot, but they encouraged me to uh, do both and saw to it that, uh, that I had ample opportunity. I, if, I, if I use one word, morning and night, is I thank God for the opportunities that have been given me, and I'm serious. I have been given opportunities both in the military and in, in what is an extraordinary life that few people ever get. And I've had the physical, perhaps the mental strength, to have accepted those opportunities and have taken them on as great personal crusades. And, the, and, the, and I, my children say to me, Dad, why are you working an eight, nine hour day? Why are you working until midnight some nights? I want to go and cross the river in the traces. I have no intention of retiring on this subject. 
of trying to save the very best of Florida and trying to protect the laws that we passed under the Nixon, Ford, and Carter <laughs> administration. You, um, you mentioned uh, opportunities. Uh, a, a key moment was in 1966 with the election of Claude Kirk <laughs> as governor of Florida, the first Republican elected governor since Reconstruction. Uh, shortly after his election, he came to you and asked you to join his administration as his chief environmental policy advisor. When you entered the governor's office shortly after that term began, what was the Florida, what was Florida like? And what were the challenges that you recall? Well, it was a completely democratic uh, administration that had been in place for, uh, since Reconstruction. It was old, it was tired, it was filled with hacks, there was an enormous amount of bribery going on. There were scandals in the legislature. There were scandals in, among the uh, elected members of the cabinet. We had a unique system. Of, the governor could not run for a second term. You were supposed to make an, enough money in one term that you, did, you weren't allowed to run for a second term. And here he, was, here he was with five other elected cabinet members who could run forever. And, and did. I mean, they were so ancient that uh, uh, they slept during cabinet meetings. Uh, it was run by a group of men. There were 200 departments and agencies, 200. It was not manageable. And Kirk came in and said, I am going to break up Florida. And it was not a popular decision among the newspapers. And uh, he was criticized for a number of un incautious remarks about his fellows on the, on the cabinet. He called them the dwarfs. <laughs> and we were lucky. No sooner did he call for a special session of the legislature upon being sworn in then the federal court found that we were malapportioned. The small counties of Florida, mostly North Florida, the rural redneck counties of Northern Florida, had a hold <laughs> on the legislature. And the court went further. It said, we don't trust you to redistrict your state. You show no interest in the gerrymandering that's been going on. So they took control and they redistricted us using a computer, believe it or not, at at the Space Center, the Kennedy Space Center, and then they set a date 50 days later for an election. 50 days. It wasn't time for the special interests to give tons of money to individuals and, and put their candidates forward. And we elected the brightest and most innovating legislature in the history of Florida. And from that, even though there was war among the legislature and Kirk, we completely changed, the governor completely changed Florida from 200 agencies to eight. And the, environmental, and the environmental focus that he had bringing you in at that point. We, after he was inaugurated, it was the coldest day that I've ever lived through in Tallahassee. I gotta be honest with you. My wife and I went and sat on the floor of the governor's office. I had campaigned for him for 80 days. Uh, you know, politics in Florida, not for a governor, nothing happens in Florida until the last 60 days because the weather is so miserable <laughs> in August and September and October that there isn't, nobody turns out for anything. And um, uh, what we used to call four shirts a day, that's how hot it was. <laughs> we campaigned in an old DC-3. We hung our shirts up in hangers as we got into the plane. We had undershirts on. We hung our shirt up to see if we could get through the next stop. Anyway, um, I was sitting on the floor eating uh, fried chicken from, with my wife when he came and put his arm on my head and said, follow me. We walked down the corridor and there was a tiny office on the right hand side. And he said, you've been driving everybody in Florida stark raving crazy with your environmental activism. Take this office. Be my ad ad environmental advisor. 
I can't afford to pay you because the, the governor's uh, amount of money in the budget for the governor's office is tiny, and I'm hiring some real pros to help me. Will you work for me for a dollar a year? <laughs> I went back and sat down and said to my wife, this sounds expensive, but <laughs> would you consider moving to Tallahassee with the three children, little children? She said, Nathaniel, this is what you should do. So we began. And uh, at that time, Florida was really filthy. All of the sewage from Palm Beach to the Keys ran raw into the Atlantic Ocean. The Board of Health had declared that the cure for pollution was dilution. <laughs> all of the big cities on the west coast of Florida, from Sarasota south, all of their raw sewage went into the Gulf. So I became the czar of trying to get sewage treatment plants built, and putting in, obviously, miles and miles of sewage pipelines to connect it. And it was an agonizing four years. On top of that, we had a terrible thing going on in Florida, a scandal called the sale of submerged lands, where lands were sold for instant housing, and, and the land was cleared and filled by dredges. Uh, called dredge and fill permits that were ru routinely handed out to whoever could pay the most to the uh, core, and uh, I'm sorry to say, and to the state. And uh, we ended that. So, so when, when that action was taken, that was a landmark decision that... Both the sewage and the, and the, and the uh, act yes. of stopping the, the stopping the sale of submerged lands and the dredge and filling. So when that, when that was occurring and that, that action was taken in the late 1960s, Governor Kirk was then engaged in a re-election effort, which he then lost in 1970. Uh, politics can be uh, ruthless. Um, you were then deciding what to do next after Governor Kirk's defeat. Uh, the federal government and the President of the United States had recently passed the uh, National Environmental Policy Act of 1969. Here you are as a young man with young children, and there was an opportunity to take your talents to Washington. Tell us of the moment when President Nixon asked you to join his administration in 1971. I flew in. I had held a, a very controversial and difficult two-day air quality hearing in Jacksonville, the dirtiest city in Florida. Uh, when my wife called me to leave the podium and announced that Secretary of Interior Morton wanted me to fly over the Everglades in the President's helicopter the next morning which presented some problems from getting from Jacksonville to Hope Sound, from Hope Sound to um, the landing with the takeoff site in uh, Miami Harbor, which my brilliant wife negotiated. We flew over the Everglades seven hours. We refueled twice. He saw everything from the sugarcane plantations um, all the way around to the Florida Bay. And when we en ended, we had a press conference. We went upstairs for a much needed cold beer at the bar of the airport hotel, where he passed me a letter which said, Nathaniel Reed, I would like to appoint you as Assistant Secretary for Fish, Wildlife, and National Parks. Please don't let me down, Richard Nixon. And he got a second envelope, which was from Rogers Morton, which said, we have, the, we have a, a friendship that's deep. We have an opportunity to change our country Please say yes. So I flew home to my wife, and I looked her in the eye, and I said, we have to make a choice uh, to stay here on beautiful Jupiter Island and play bad golf and bridge and, uh, or go to Washington and go to work. And she said, without hesitation, she said, Nathaniel, this is the greatest job in the federal government. Take it. For God's sakes, take it. And so I left for Washington the next day. It was conf uh, Within days, I stayed at the Jefferson Hotel. She wouldn't let me stay at the Hay Adams. We had a big argument about that. And uh, uh, I, I walked to the, I had my appointment with John Ehrlichman, entered the White House, 
And because I had, ma I had one stipulation, which I had told John ahead of time. I said, I have one stipulation on taking this job. I get to appoint my own staff. The Republican National Committee is not going to appoint my staff. John said, I give you my word, I'll support that. So I was in his office reiterating. And when an equerry came in and said, the president wishes to see Mr. Reed. So in I come, I sat down. And the president said, um, Reed, I really don't give a darn about the environment. <laughs> I've got a war on my hands. I've got a war with Congress on my hands. I've got a war with the budget on my hands. But I want the best environmental record of any president that's ever served. And I'm turning to you, and I'm turning to Russell Train and to Bill Ruckelshaus. And just don't get me in too much trouble and go do it. So that, so that, and that's anyway, and then he said, what's your first priority? I said, my first priority, Mr. President, to have on your desk an executive order banning the terrible poison 1080. I don't know how many of you in this room know what 1080 was, but it's the single most terrible poison ever invented that was used to clear the West for the she subsidized sheep growers of coyotes. But it killed every animal that touched those baits died and the animals that touched the carcasses of those animals died. And I said, I'm going to have an executive order with an EIA, an environmental impact statement, on your desk by January 1st. And he said, you know, Pat has told me that it's a <laughs> terrible poison. I'll sign that executive order. <laughs> What's your second priority? <laughs> I said, I'm going to have an executive order for you banning DDT. Oh, I said, John Olin will be really pleased with me on that one, Reed. <laughs> Th what's third? I said, Mr. President, I have to be able to hire my own staff. He said, I'll bet they'll all be Democrats. <laughs> I said, no, Mr. President, they'll all be experts. <laughs> um, <laughs> be before, we, uh, before we transition to the Everglades, just express briefly the impact of the 1972 passage and the signing of the, the Clean Water Act by President Nixon, what has that had on the, the impact on this country? Well, it was, it's incredible. Uh, we had rivers on fire. There was not a river in the United States that wasn't highly polluted by sewage and by industrial waste. The Great Lakes were dreadfully impacted by both agricultural waste and by industrial waste, and by untreated or undertreated sewage. It, we were an international disgrace to ourselves. And the Congress heard from the American people that they'd had enough. And so under Russell Trains, who had become then the chairman of the Council on Environmental Equality, he pulled together everybody involved in federal government that had anything to do with clean water. And I represented an interior because I had the Fish and Wildlife Service. You can't have fish unless you have clean water. You can't have waterfowl unless you have clean water. You can't have anything unless you have clean water. So I represented interior. And we put together the finest scientific staffs to write the Clean Water Act of 72. And we spent months, often meeting at 6 o'clock at night and working until 9 o'clock at night, language experts checking off with the Office of Management and Budget, checking off with the relevant committees in Congress. And slowly but surely, we put the bill together, and it passed almost unanimously from the United States Congress in the fall of 19, late fall of 1972. The White House was perfectly briefed all along the process, and the President vetoed it. <laughs> And all of us who were involved began writing our letters of resignation when George Schultz, who was the head of the Office of Environment and <laughs> Budget and Management and Budget, called and said, I hear there's a rumor you're all getting ready to resign. Stop it. 
The first action by the Congress as they meet in 1973 will be to override the presidential veto. <laughs> and it was. <laughs> and, but since the act had passed in 72, it, it kept the, the Clean Water Act of 72. And right away, immediately thereafter, I was working on a second team with experts. We passed the Endangered Species Act, which E.O. Wilson said was the most important wildlife act passed in 200 years. And then came a whole series, Marine Mammal Act, a whole series of lesser acts with Forest Practice Act, Land Management Act, and ended up by passing the famous Magnuson Act, Magnuson-Stevens Act, which gave us the 200-mile limit, chased the foreign ships, crawlers offshore, and began the process, hopefully, of rebuilding our saltwater fishing stocks on the Atlantic and Pacific coast. It's been amended nine times, and it has failed. But so, so if I may, with, with, that, with that in place, with these historic landmark legislation in place, the law of the land, we still face a number of challenges today across this country, but in particular in the Everglades. And before we talk about those particular issues, I, wanna, I want the audience to see a short video that sort of summarizes what we're facing in Florida at this very moment. A health alert on the Treasure Coast. Look at that mess. Test results confirm what residents, businesses, and environmentalists fear. That algae is toxic to both people and pets. Right now, until further notice, Martin County health officials say residents should not go into the water along the St. Lucie River. Environmentalists are blaming the algae bloom on all the polluted water being released from Lake Okeechobee. We're seeing signs like these, high bacteria levels. Tomorrow, algae warnings are coming up. The county telling people, stay out of the water. And that's the bloom right there. This covered our river for four months this summer. The brown water is so far south we can't find blue water. Anxiety is rising. Environmentalists looking on estimate four and a half billion gallons each day are now pouring out of Lake Okeechobee. You can see animals in distress. We've lost 97% of the seagrass beds. People they could get vomiting and diarrhea, skin irritation and rashes. Disaster is not a too strong of a word. It's, it's catastrophic for the health of this uh, river, this estuary. To the point with Michael Williams. The locks are open again. The water from Lake Okeechobee is pouring into the St. Lucie River and then onto the estuary and Indian River Lagoon again. Are we looking at another year of toxic water on our treasure coast? When I heard the water was flowing out of Lake Okeechobee, I wasn't surprised. It's gonna happen year after year after year. We're dooming those communities and those estuaries to environmental and ecological disaster. It makes me feel weak. It makes me feel like I have no control over the destruction of my beautiful hometown. The community is outraged, and the community continues to be outraged. Every, every year or two years when we get these discharges from Lake Okeechobee, it's just devastating to our economy. This is an emergency. This waterway is on its last leg, and it can't stand another massive discharge. Well, as uh, Yogi Berra once said, it is deja vu all over again. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the news that came out of uh, uh, Jacksonville last week, where the Army Corps is beginning to release um, polluted water down the St. Lucie into the Indian River Lagoon, it is setting up the potential for that disaster again, that lost summer that we experienced in 2013. It doesn't have to be this way, and that's what saddens me. We have this solution right in front of us. There's an option on the table right now to buy land that is currently uh, used for sugar farming, 26,000 acres directly south of Lake Okeechobee, that if purchased, could be that land for storage. You can store a foot of lake water in that reservoir that would have to be built, send it south into those filtration marshes, those man-made wetlands, to where it can be cleaned and then sent into the Everglades. And at the southern end, allow the water to go into Florida Bay. Last November, 
We passed Amendment 1 to make sure that we had a dedicated source of funding to tell the state of Florida and our elected officials, secure the land that's necessary to keep this the most beautiful state in the country. Most importantly, acquiring this land will secure the drinking water for 8 million South Floridians. This option to acquire this 26,000 acres for water storage expires October 1st of 2015. If we let this go, there's no plan B. If the land south of the lake is not purchased, we will never have what we need to send the water south. But now, today, our elected officials are wavering because the sugar industry wants out of a deal that they struck in a better time. If we let this go, it just shows that the most important thing for Everglades restoration has been beaten back by special interests. With this mandate we have, the, the voters have made it very clear to elected officials, this is money we want put aside to correct this problem. If 75% of the people approve that, then there has to be hope. I think the message that Governor Scott and the legislature should take is that people want Florida to be the paradise that they envision it to be for their businesses and for their families, and we are counting on them to put this in motion now. So here's what we need to do. We're voters, we're taxpayers. Pick up the phone, call your legislator, write Rick Scott. If you've got a relationship with him, you've got to call Rick Scott. You've got to tell him, this deal is the best chance we have for a long-term fix for the Everglades. Please join in this effort. As you see, this is the challenge that we're facing at home as we sit here tonight. Since January 16th of this year, 120 billion gallons of water from Lake Okeechobee has been dumped east and west, and that water is polluted. And it's had a, it's had a devastating impact both on the local ecologies and the, and the economies of these local communities. You've been at this now for many, many <laughs> decades, trying to restore America's Everglades. In our remaining moments and before we take some questions, what is the, in your view, what is the biggest challenge today facing restoration of the Everglades, the largest environmental pro project in the history of the world? I, I don't think there's one. I, 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 I'm here at the Danforth Center, which is very important for the world of agriculture. But in the world of agriculture, there is not a body of water in Florida, freshwater body of water in Florida or estuary that's not polluted by phosphorus and nitrogen from fertilizer or from animal waste. It's the greatest disappointment of my life that we weren't able to add to the Clean Water Act agricultural runoff. But the Congress is not willing to accept that, po that potential of enforcing strict rules on the discharge of, of flowing of, of fertilizers into bodies of fresh water owned by their states. The second is <coughs> Apathy of the federal government going from one administration being gung-ho for two or three years and then getting tired. The present administration is getting tired. Uh, the Congress is much more difficult to work with on an appropriation standpoint. Florida has more than put up its share of the 50 percent of uh, the water, the, the, the money that we promised under the comprehensive Everglades plan. We have put up about 250 percent more money than the federal government has. And that's the fault of Congress for not keeping the appropriations up. But having spent $1.9 trillion in Afghanistan and $1 trillion in Iraq, it gets pretty hard to ask the Congress for 
300 million dollars of sustained funding per year, because that's what we need. <coughs> so we're challenged by the fact that federal money is getting much more difficult to get ahead with. We are challenged by the fact that we still do not have competent measures for the removal of phosphorus and nitrogen, leaving farms, orange groves, sewage treatment plants, and that's why the $10 million campaign by the Everglades Foundation, we have offered $10 million to any firm that can come up with a method of stripping phosphorus from water. The Everglades evolved with no phosphorus in it. It is a system that is built on fresh water running over a huge marsh south of Lake Okeechobee that is nitrogenous. That's where the sugar cane, 500,000 acres of subsidized sugar cane, which you're all paying for. We're all paying for this nightmare, this nightmare crop we're paying for. When the world price of sugar is 14, 15 cents a pound, they're guaranteed 28 cents a pound of our money. Crazy, madness. <laughs> um, we have got to move, we've got to upstream, we've got to do our very best to stop the lake from being continued polluted. And below the lake, we can take the water from the lake, run it through a, into a reservoir, a major reservoir, hold it, release it slowly into man-made marshes, which strip the phosphorus from the water and be released into the Everglades and get the Everglades wet again. The, a wet Everglades means that the Biscayne Aquifer, which <laughs> produces all of the drinking water for 8.1 million Floridians living in South Florida, is totally dependent upon the water coming out of Lake Okeechobee. And yet, you know, this is, we, we sent a man to the moon. This is not rocket science. <laughs> this is sim it is extraordinarily simple, except for, and I've got to say this, Mr. Danforth, I've, mm -hmm. except for the problems of the pollution from fertilizers, man-made fertilizers, phosphorus and nitrogen. Nitrogen is the creator of the enormous algal blooms that we face in Lake Okeechobee, we face on the east coast along the Indian River Lagoon, we face on the west coast that accelerates the creation of red tide. Uh, the tons of nitrogen, because Florida is sandy, that's dropped on our land every year is absolutely astonishing, and it ends up in our waterways, all of our waters, lakes, rivers, streams, estuaries, you name it. We, um, we certainly experienced that two years ago. The city of Toledo, Ohio, experienced it last August, toxic algae impacting the water. Um, I, wanna, I wanna just take a few questions. From agricultural runoff. Uh, I wanna take a few questions that are coming to us from Twitter. Okay. Um, a, a question from Ag Word Banks. Um, question is, what lessons, advice can you offer to those, uh, with fa those farmers who are interested in conservation? Uh, and habitat restoration. What would you tell a farmer who's interested in those type of oh, practices? Oh, I've been all over the Eastern Shore trying to persuade farmers, I, I think with some success on Chesapeake Bay, to leave a buffer zone between your farm fields and uh, the bay and the rivers that go into the bay so that a great deal of uh, rain-driven rain runoff from highly fertilized fields that are growing corn and soybeans are eaten up by a man, a, 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 a natural marsh or a natural greenery before it goes into the bay. And we have succeeded in reducing the amount of nutrients going into Chesapeake Bay enormously. This is something that I think in new agriculture is keep your fertilizer on your <laughs> own land. It belongs to you. <laughs> it does not belong to the receiving waters of the United States. <laughs> so it's better management of your own farm. Uh, another, um, another question um, pertaining to farmers and the agricultural industry in Florida. This also comes from Ag, Ag Word Banks. Um, has the, has uh, farmers or ag entities engaged in the movement to restore the Everglades? No. Why not? Because they find it highly profitable not to. 
They find it highly profitable to continue uh, growing sugarcane and sweet corn and uh, not paying the uh, cost of cleaning up their waste. Um, the taxpayers of the 16 counties of South Florida pay the overwhelming share of the cost of the, of the man-made marshes and the management of those marshes. And that water comes from drainage from ag. And yet the landowners in ag only pay a very minor percentage <laughs> of the overall cost. And they don't want to change it. And so they don't want to change it. They give millions of dollars to the legislature to see that it doesn't change. And so far, they've been successful. Uh, I appreciate, appreciate your candid um, response. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, our, in our closing minutes, uh, I, I know a number of folks who I had a chance to interact with at the reception spend time in Florida, both on the East Coast and the West Coast. Certainly, you're, you live here in, in St. Louis, here in Missouri. But tell folks in this room and who are going to be watching this program why should they be concerned about the Missouri River, the Mississippi River, and the Everglades? Why are all those connected? Your great river system is an integral part of America. It's one of the greatest river systems ever in the world. The Everglades is a unique, badly damaged, ecosystem that is one of the greatest ecosystems on the face of the earth. There's nothing else quite like it. So we share a mutual responsibility as stewards of this earth, something that we all in this room understand fully, that we're here for a comparatively short period of time, and stewardship of Mother Earth is part of our duty, our collective and individual duty. And the dead zone at the mouth of the Mississippi is just as much a responsibility of us in Florida <coughs> as is the dirty water pouring out of the estuaries, into the estuaries from Lake Okeechobee. We're all in this together, ladies and gentlemen. And we have got to unite and we have got to train our young people to understand and confront this great environmental issue we have the legislation, we don't have the money from the Congress, and we are lacking will, will and courage, with one of the emails I got yesterday. We're lacking courage to move ahead, uh, both at the, at the congressional level and certainly at the legislative level in Florida today. And I thank you all for coming <laughs> and being part of this extraordinary evening. And Mr. Danforth, you're, the work of this institution is vital vital, uh, serving on the National Geographic Board. We chose water 15 years ago as to be the number one issue of the National Geographic Society for the next God knows how many years. Mm -hmm. The water problems in Kenya right now, once upon a time, the argument during drought was with spears between tribes. It's now with AK-47s. The water problems across the world are growing. I just had a, a, a cousin come back from Ibakistan who said that the great glaciers of Ibakistan are melting at a record rate, unknown in, this, in, this, in the last two, two centuries. We're all in this together. Our world is changing dramatically around us, and we have got to change our attitude toward pollution and the conservation of water. And and making sure that the water that we have is not polluted by sewage or, or, or chemical pollutants or agricultural pollutants. That mm -hmm. has been my mission, and it will continue to be until my last breath. Thanks the, for uh, doing it. The, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, The, uh, the water quality work that we're doing in, in, in an effort to restore America's Everglades continues. I, we know and we salute the work that's being done here at the Plant Center for Sustainable Agriculture and the research that's happening each and every day, again, is vital to the future of this country and this world. 
We have been delighted to be here. Dr. Danforth, again, thank you for this invitation. Jim, thank you for your hospitality and for all of you coming out and learning a little bit more about the Everglades. Evergladesfoundation.org is a good place to find out some more info. Dan, thank you as well for a true ambassador to the Everglades. Thanks for being here, and thanks to all of you for coming. Be before you leave, and uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. This was a real special evening. This was a treat. For those of you who have been coming to conversations for some time now, uh, this was a little different. We did something a little different tonight. Uh, and I think you're going to see a little more experimentation in the future. Uh, let me l leave you with this one thought. Uh, many of you have heard us talking for years about sustainability and agriculture. We've talked about issues with nitrogen and phosphorus contamination in our great waterways. I have never been able to paint the picture for you that was painted for you tonight. When you think about the Everglades, the Missouri River, the Mississippi River, and what happens in the Gulf, that's a consequence of management of our agricultural resources and our agricultural inputs that are in serious imbalance with nature. The Everglades Foundation is leading the way in bringing this issue to the attention of the public and helping craft solutions to do something about it. What we're doing at the Danforth Center is addressing exactly the same problem. We're simply attacking it from a different point of view, from the point of view of the farm, from the point of view of the farmer and the technology available to that farmer, and from the point of view of the seed that gets planted on that farm that can use water more efficiently, that can use and take up phosphorus and nitrogen more efficiently, so you simply have to put less on the field. And if we can do it in a far more efficient way with a much better natural reserve of wild vegetation between the farm and the waterway, I think we have a solution. And I think uh, you can uh, uh, look to that as the sustainability component of the agricultural research that we're doing right here. I also want to thank uh, before you leave, Eric, thank you so much for coming and your work with the Everglades Foundation. Dan, uh, you're, you're one of our local heroes right here, a stalwart supporter of the Danforth Center. And I want to leave you with a final thought. Uh, we talk about some of the giants in our field. Uh, and I, I, I want to leave you with this image. Uh, we stand on the shoulders of giants with food security, We've got one foot on Norman Borlaug. I want you to put the other foot on Nathaniel Reed. Nathaniel, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right.